We're also seeing some non-technological issues, such as raw material sources. Both Clovis and Salutrian people went out of their way to find the prettiest, most workable stone they could, and when possible, they flaked quartz crystal. These are uh, uh, examples of Clovis artifacts made out of quartz crystal uh, from North Carolina to Idaho. And if there's quartz crystal, you know they're doing it. Uh, Salutri guys did the same thing. Of course, what he doesn't mention is that the sizes of the two caches in the picture are not the same, that he actually made them match for the picture. Although it is certainly true that both Solitrian and Clovis snappers often made a special effort to obtain exotic raw materials for the manufacture of bifaces, that is certainly not universally true. Whether the stone in an assemblage is exotic or not depended upon the scale of the settlement system. Many late glacial age assemblages in eastern North America are dominated by locally available lithic raw material. It is true the material is usually of high quality. But then the same can be said of many mobile hunter-gatherers who had access to high-quality stone and who needed reliable and maintainable toolkits. In any case it also must be emphasized, as Bradley and Stanford admit, that the stone used in Clovis assemblages was rarely heat-treated, while such was often practiced in solitary and technology. And a lot of times these two particular caches are just bifaces. What he doesn't mention is that the Volgu cache also has a substantial amount of shouldered, unifacial blades something that is not found at all in pre-Clovis or Clovis. Art. The Salutrian people are known for their artwork. Clovis people aren't. Uh, but Clovis people are staying out of caves, and I'm not quite sure why that is. I could give you some thoughts on that. But nonetheless, they both have portable art. And uh, portable art consists of everything from scratches, designs, to anthropomorphic and zoomorphic figures. And I kind of like this particular group because these are all showing arrows or spears stuck into hapless critters all the way from uh, Italy, across Spain, and out to Galt, Texas. And uh, using the same motif, but then again, if you're going to draw a spear with feathers on it, that's probably what you'd do. Let us assume for the sake of argument that a group of Solitrian people successfully negotiated the Pleistocene North Atlantic, a journey they would otherwise stymie humans for 16,000 years. What would we see? The same thing we see in countless other instances in prehistory in which groups arrive on a new landscape. This colonizing Solitrian group would have carried with them the full code for reproducing their culture. Every tool and artifact they and their descendants produced would have been determined by that knowledge. New forms and technologies would be invented over time, but in the early centuries and millennia of settlement, their roots in solitary in Europe would be deep and unmistakable. Thus, we should not see just one or a few similarities between the artifacts of America and Europe. We should see scores of them. We should see similarities not just in functional items, but also in the kind of culturally distinctive technologies and stylistic attributes humans use to mark who they are and the peoples to whom they belong. And we should not just see an instant abandonment of forms and attributes characteristic of the material culture they brought with them, but instead a series of evolutionary changes in the material culture occurring in different forms at different rates at different times, as old forms were adapted to new situations. All of this is in contrast to a situation in which two assemblages are historically unrelated. Unlike Bradley and Stanford, we feel it is necessary to go beyond merely pointing, as they do with considerable hyperbole, to the supposedly amazing and supposedly astounding similarities between two complexes. After all, if one looks hard enough at two large and disparate assemblages, it is usually possible to find some similarities. But, in order to assess whether they mark a direct ancestral descendant relationship, one has to examine them against the overall number of similarities and especially the differences between the two assemblages. If those assemblages are unrelated, there will be far more differences than similarities, and the similarities that occur will be primarily related to adaptation and parallel evolution of technology, and represent similar responses to similar environmental challenges. The essential point here is that, if the Solnitrian claim is correct, we should not just see similarities in isolated traits between America and Europe. We should see broad similarities across entire assemblages in stylistic, functional and technological elements, and, early on at least, in pre-Clovis times, very few differences. 
Although small numbers of bone artifacts have been found in Clovis contexts, solitary and osseous assemblages are much richer, with angler points, wands, spagulae, eyed needles and works of portable art. The latter can be made on stone, for example the nearly 2500 engraved or painted slabs from the solitrian of Parpaio cave in Valencia, tooth, for example the bird figurine on a bear canine from the solitrian of El Bushu cave in Asturias, antler or bone. Perforated and sometimes engraved teeth, notably red deer elk canines, presumably used as necklace beads, are frequent. To be sure. Part of the scarcity of such artifacts may be that bone preservation in Clovis sites is often poor, but there are many Clovis and pre-Clovis age sites with good faunal preservation that do not yield such materials. In recent years, especially as a result of direct AMS radiocarbon dating of images made with charcoal, it has become apparent that much more Upper Paleolithic cave art, in Spain and France is of solitary and age than had once been thought. We know that drawings and paintings in such sites as Nerja and La Puleta in Andalusia, Phase II of Cosker, Tete de Lion and Cugnac, all in southern France, and engravings in Ambrosio, Andalusia, Le Placard, Charent, and Asturias, French Basque Country, were done in solitary in times, and we have strong reasons, for example archaeological associations, stylistic similarities to dated portable art to believe that many other cave art images are also of this age including friezes of sculpted images at Forno du Diable and Roc de Sers in southwest France and the red outline paintings of the so-called Ramales school. In over a half dozen Cantabrian caves, it is even highly likely that much of the open-air rock art of the Coal Valley in northeast Portugal is of solitary and age, given the proximity of solitary and living sites and stylistic similarity to the Parpeo engraved slabs. Finally, the most recent, major study of Lasco concludes that much or even most of its art is solitrian. Nowhere in Clovis, or pre-Clovis, is there rock art like this. Bradley and Stanford observe that engraved limestone pieces have been recovered, but the entire corpus consists of only a few dozen specimens, all but two of which come from a single site in Galt, Texas. In this regard, little has changed since the 19th century. When the search began in America for art comparable in antiquity or form to that of Paleolithic Europe. So pronounced was the dearth of early art even then, that when unbalanced American archaeologists went so far as to fabricate a specimen of counterfeit Paleolithic art, using the La Madeleine mammoth plaque as a model to engrave the outline of a mammoth on a whelk shell he claimed to have found in Pleistocene deposits in Delaware. Obviously, Upper Paleolithic solitary and peoples practiced non perishable art in many forms and contexts, while Clovis peoples did not. This dichotomy between the European and American records dramatically does not fit the expectations of a solitary and Clovis peopling scenario. Why would the incredible artistic ability and productivity of the solitary and people have been lost during a supposed transatlantic voyage? And when you look at solitary and pre-Clovis, the differences are even larger. The tools that arise later in Clovis are not seen in pre-Clovis. Yet Stanford uses these tools to compare solitary in a couple of thousand years earlier, to a much lighter Clovis. And the artwork, even supposed portable ones claimed by Stanford is nowhere to be seen in.